my my AI involvement started from simple interest and awareness of what I considered a, a tsunami that was on the on the cusp of washing over our civilization for, for that matter. Um, AI is it may not be omnipresent, but it's it's close to it. Um, I like to say that I'm no computer scientist or programmer or whatnot. I'm someone who's interested in AI theoretically in its applications, especially uh, to counseling and broader mental health. And um, we formed the task force. The task force was formed um, for us and we were appointed. <clears throat> and it culminated in, um, in these series of recommendations that AI will release. And the recommendations are geared towards practicing counselors uh, and to clients. We also uh, issued a series of suggestions for ACA for things to consider for the future as well, because it looks like AI is here to stay. And it's best that we all uh, keep up to date, prior best anyway, to stay informed on uh, the ever evolving nature of artificial intelligence. I know as a counselor educator, students are coming and asking me questions. Uh, colleagues are coming and asking questions and we did not have anything formal in place as a field. So that is where this year's task force picked up the mantle from where Russell and I uh, started uh, under Dr. Kim Butler's presidency. And this is where we are now with actually having our first round of recommendations uh, to the ACA members in the greater community. Um, regarding for counselors, um, I think step one and an overarching goal of ours was to raise awareness where we are aware that for some folks, they're very much in the know and have a high level of comprehension about AI, but others, they hear about it here and there. And we are ethically obliged before we use something to be quite uh, competent in it. So one of our goals and one of the recommendations we have is to accumulate more knowledge about AI. Now we could unpackage that a little bit. What is AI? We could start with definitions. Um, if you want to go into a little bit more depth, the recommendation is to learn about AI subfields like uh, natural language processing, um, robotics, at least some of the algorithms that are used. So when this terminology is thrown around rather than, you know, I'm not sure what that is, you have at least a rudimentary knowledge of it. I think that would be step one. Um, regarding for for clients uh, anyway, to again, be good consumers of information. Um, pretty prominent today, more practically speaking, would be these chat bots out there. Um, there's a number of them. And I like to say they are mental health support agents. Um, they're not therapists or counselors, but they can be uh, they can have use as mental health support. There's been some research done on on some of them to support um, their their efficacy somewhat. Um, so for for clients, if they are using one, one of these bots as an augment to their counseling to bring it up to their therapist and, and keep them in the know. And then uh, finally, I guess for for everyone, um, you know, Transparency um, and it, it is important. Um, safeguarding data, data security, and privacy. So counselors and clients have a have a stake in in this one. Um, so that's I'll, I'll I'll leave it there for now. But in in some, those are a few things that come to. Mind. Yeah, uh, I think for me, um, and this was very like at the forefront of our discussion as a group when we started working towards this task was really, uh, remember, we have ethical codes, that stand, we have eth ethical codes, right? ACA ethical codes. And we have, you know, codes that we have, you know, those of us who are licensed and certified, we have multiple boards that hold us accountable as professionals. Uh, so for me, it's just starting there and remembering in all things that we do, we have to be ethical. Uh, and that means we need to make sure whatever platform you're integrating, that has to be, you know, we have to be HIPAA and FERPA compliant, those of us who are in education. Um, and so 
we really kind of was like, yeah, this AI thing is new. It's really outside, as Russell mentioned. We're not programmers. We're not engineers. This is completely outside of us. However, as a profession, we have standards, we have codes of ethics that have already been in place that really we start there in making any decisions, uh, whether we're dealing with our students in the classroom, supervising, uh, whether we're clinicians in the field and we're trying to support clients who want to integrate some really cool things in their, uh, in their work with us in, in the counseling space. And so we're be falling back, if, if nothing else, right, making sure we're being ethical in our practice. Because uh, I think one of the, the things I always I bring up these days with my students is that some of these platforms and uh, things that's coming out is very exciting. It is not, like nothing we've seen before. It's exciting. It's a lot of fun. But ultimately, who is this going to be beneficial to that student experience, to that client experience, right? We don't want to just run behind things that are flashy and colorful or and exciting or because somebody posted on TikTok and they got a billion views, but we want to make sure that ultimately there's that ethical consideration. So with clients, our practitioners need to make sure is that, you know, chatbot, is it, what is the, um, the, the privacy guidelines behind it? A lot of these are open AI, which means there's no protection in the data that's being fed into these programs. So ultimately, as far as the work that we can do with, cl with clients, we cannot integrate it as a clinician. Now, if your client wants to, right, that is a decision that they're making, but we need to make sure we're educating our clients and be like, hey, this chatbot is great. You know, it looks like it could support the work that we do, but be mindful that whatever information you're putting in it, somebody could have access to it. Um, and so that continued education piece, which ties into that ethical practice um, that we we're already are being held to as professionals across the board. Uh, so I think it was important to kind of go back to our core as who we are as professionals and be like, before anything else, we got to be ethical. We got to be competent. Uh, so it was important to just restate that piece uh, because I feel like it guides all other decisions moving forward. Yeah, well, I know a lot of the um, platforms that we're using as clinicians for like documentation is already generating uh, content for us, right? So before, you know, those of us who've been in the field for a minute, we had the paper and pen and pencil. We had to write all the notes out and physically put them in your client chart. But now with all these other, um, you know, systems that's out, now you can go in and do checklists. You know, you can go in and check your client's, you know, presentation, symptomology, and you hit generate and it would generate a note for you. Right. So very chat GPT. So we, we've already been integrating some level of AI and some of the work that we're doing. And this goes back to what Russell was mentioning. We need to educate ourselves in what we're already doing because uh, we've already have a lot of AI aspects to the work that we're doing, but because it's not chat GPT level, we haven't noticed it. It's been integrated and it's making our work a lot easier but we didn't realize that when you're able to go in and check a couple of things and you hit that generate uh, note and it, it, it spills out this beautifully written clinical note, that's AI, <laughs> you know, that's an AI capability that's, that's been embedded. So for clinicians, it's really been uh, along the lines of streamlining the work that we're doing on the documentation side, which is very helpful if you think about, you know, how much time uh, we spend with, putting together notes, writing notes and documentations and things like that. So that's been one of the things that's already been done. And I can see it even becoming more efficient as some of these platforms are becoming or getting access to more advanced technology. Uh, another piece has been integrating some of the, like the chat, G, the, the chat bots that Russell were, was um, referring to. I have seen a couple of colleagues already out who are integrating uh, this chat bot. So basically they're kind of like that in between session support for clients. And so along the lines of 
So basically taking journaling and logging and taking it one step further because now these chatbots are able to interact with you. So if you're going in and let's say you're supposed to be tracking your mood and you go in and you log, the, some of these chatbots will ask follow-up questions. They will ask probing questions where you're going from just charting your mood to having a more in-depth reflection on what's happening in the moment. And so those are some of the, the things that we're seeing coming out. Unfortunately, some of the chatbots that I have seen, again, they have open AI. So that's where we've got to be careful uh, and make sure we're, we're reading the fine, fine, fine print <laughs> of these, you know, these companies that's, that's coming out. Um, so that's really like on the clinical side, I would say streamlining documentation and offering that in-between session support uh, for clients. For the future, I, I would foresee the auditory capabilities of AI really heightening. I think you will see more of the vocal. Right now, generative AI is, is a, it's not exclusively, but predominantly text with the likes of clinical note-taking, chat GPT, and I think it's going to be able to hold conversations, speak with you um, more. So I, I foresee that coming. And also in the future, there's there's every sign from the research that it will help more with, with diagnosis. And this is kind of a dicey subject. Um, a lot more needs to be developed and researched. So let me be mindful of that. But um, we can... There's a lot to criticize about the way we we currently diagnosed, and there's some, there's some issues with reliability and, and consistency. And one thing that AI excels in many things, but one of which is a pattern recognition. And I'm impressed by this ability because a mark of a experienced clinician diagnostician is the ability to um, extrapolate insight and and themes from data sets. Uh, now, AI does it different than we do with our with our senses here or in real time, but it's good at that. And I think that's going to transfer into um, maybe newer and better ways to help us diagnose. So there's research out there now, and I foresee that uh, just getting more and more so in, into the future. So anyway, um, I think the vocal abilities and, and uh, diagnosis is something to keep an eye out um, as we move into tomorrow. And even looking at, um, and I, I had, that's, sorry, I was, I had to look this up because I wanted to give credit where credit's due. Um, so in, I think in conjunction to AI, I think we just need to look at just this other investment in technology. So you have like virtual reality and virtual simulation that, um, where you see, you, I've actually seen more work being done with that integration because there's still that human factor. Um, I feel like we're more comfortable with that. So I, I had to look up uh, in a Stanford Medical uh, School. They're currently using virtual reality, so like the Oculus goggles, to treat individuals who are experiencing, who are struggling with hoarding. So they create like a virtual space and they go in and they practice those uh, behavior skills of like decluttering before we send them home, be like, I need you to declutter your living room before our next session. So like being in a space and and working through that. And so um, as Russell was mentioning, not like this ability to interface and interact beyond text is really where you're going to see a lot of this happening. And I'm hoping with us as ACA continue to focus on how we can integrate ethically this advanced technology, we can also be invited to sit at the table when this technology is being created specifically around mental health. Because right now what's happening, you have a lot of these tech companies that are they're meeting a need, right? We're in an age and a time where mental health is at the top of every of every discussion that's being had, which is great. But we also know, you know, capitalism. <laughs> Some people are gonna come and, you know, trying to see how can I create a niche, how can I get in on this um trend that's happening. And to me, the most unfortunate thing is where the mental health professionals are not a part of the conversations with some of this tech that's being developed specifically to use to address mental health. 
uh, concerns. And so a, a lot of, so with, with the part with Russ is talking about, I, I see the same thing that evolution is. Now you're going to have like a, you know, avatar that pops up instead of a chat response, it's going to actually going to have almost like you're sitting in a Zoom call and be able to engage in a dialogue, uh, which again, I think is a really awesome thing to consider. But the thing for me, I'm always thinking about, okay, who was involved in the development? Is this ethical? Is this, you know, are, are we protecting our clients information? Are we using this in substitution of counseling versus in support of a supplemental tool? Um, and so the evolution is going to come. The thing that we have to keep a pulse on is how we're integrating it in, in the work that we're doing and keeping that ethical piece to it and always thinking about our clients' safety first and foremost. This program is copyright 2024 by the American Counseling Association. All rights reserved.